Oh, did I call you a bitch? Johnny? <laughs> Michelle, hi there. How are you, you little bitch? <laughs> oh, straight up bitch. I called you a bitch. It's not the first time, Jesus. Why are you sounding so surprised? It's I just come so surprised. It came spilling out of my mouth. I think I know why, because I've been watching a very um, provocative pre- TV program. They, oh. say, they call each other bitches all the time. They're at each other's throat. But I'll tell you more about that later. Okay, that sounds good. Hey, everybody loved last week's music episode. Oh, it was so fun to actually have that little trip down memory lane. It was. And the what about the associated playlist on Spotify? Have you listened to it? Can, and then you're bopping, you're dancing, and then Slim Dusty's <laughs> G'day G'day comes on and it kind of ruins the mood. <laughs> or James Last, little brown jug. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening through and I was like... This is good in the episode. Is it shit as a playlist? But I don't know. It, it was a little eclectic, a little. <laughs> I'm going to leave the Sweeney theme tune in there because it does go off on a bit of a tangent. I was laughing when I was listening to it because I was trying to imagine the Maria High School um, band. And I'm talking about yeah. the, the the brass and strings band with the clarinets trying okay. to do that jazzy breakdown in the middle. I have a feeling that we didn't attempt that back in 1984 or whenever it was that we were in the band. I bet you didn't. I no. bet you just did the basic chords and done. <laughs> <laughs> retro, retro wouldn't have gone there. Retro. Retro. No, we uh, you know, we were more, like I said, Tears for Fears. Madonna, Holiday. Oh. <laughs> That's how we did it. Were you were you a singer or were you a co-singer in that band? I was the singer. Oh, Holiday. Michelle. Were yeah. you doing the dance moves? Absolutely. Did the other girls in your eight think, oh, God, she's so up herself, that Michelle. God, she thinks she's the best. She thinks she's Madonna. She, Yeah, for sure. They and all I wanted you, was they? one of those. I wanted one of those belts that said Toy Boy. <laughs> That's what I wanted. I wanted the Madonna belt. I actually didn't even know what that meant. I was just like, that belt's so cool. And I had the... <laughs> Fingerless I had gloves. The fingerless gloves. Yeah. Lace, lace fingerless gloves. Oh, yeah, I had them. From Kmart. They were fantastic. <laughs> but do you know what? I had spoken to my sister, Steph, about the episode, and she said, Michelle, I can't believe that you didn't tell people about our very first records. And I was like, well, what? And she said, it was the banana splits. La, 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 la. That's the one. But Hopefully. actually, then she said, even before that, we had. The Muppet Show. I had the Muppet Show one and two. Did you? It's the I Muppet had... Show with our very special guest, <laughs> Vincent Price. Yay! <Yeah! laughs> we had, I had Hooked on Classics. Oh. I loved that. <laughs> <laughs> That's up there with the Richard Clayderman. But be, even before that. Yeah, Rocking out. Hooked on a classic. Um, <laughs> we had these little, it's like my little golden books, except they were 45s. And we had a Cinderella and a Peter Pan. And the single had the picture book with it. Oh. So you would listen oh, to, now to them I narrating remember. the yes. story. Oh, my God. That's such Loads a blast from the past. I forgot about that. They were quite creepy. No, I, we Sometimes loved them. We creepy. had two. Oh, all right. Maybe in your house. But um, <laughs> <laughs> we absolutely loved them. And then she said, how could you forget? Like a virgin rocked our world. Yeah. Rocked it. Yeah. Madonna. And then, obviously, for Steph in particular, the Smiths. Oh, yeah. I loved the Smiths. Me too. I mean, and she was obsessed with Morrissey. In fact, when he came to Australia, she went to Sydney from Canberra on the Greyhound bus, stood outside his hotel room and wrote, we love you, Morrissey, on a watermelon. (laughs) And then I think it may have even put their hotel number or something. Anyway, left it at reception. He came out and met them. Who are the girls who left the watermelon? So she met Morrissey. Yeah, exciting. I wanted to tell you that I did get some feedback from poor Sandra, who was left standing on the side while... uh, (laughs) While you were saying goodbye to your boyfriend, <laughs> holding each other's hand, faces in your hands, going, <laughs> nothing compares to you, and crying and sweating and slapping your wet hand against a, a bus window. Goodbye, my love. She wasn't there. No, She okay. says she wasn't there. <laughs> she said she may have been there, but it doesn't ring a bell. Well, it wasn't her trauma. Do you know what the <laughs> thing is? That memory has been an enduring moment of trauma for me. 
until I talk to you and you are such a bitch and you take the piss out of my absolute heartbreak. Sorry. It <laughs> is fucking funny. No, do you know what? It is funny. I just hadn't thought of it like that. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, Sandra. I know that we were we were there around the same time. Maybe you were not at Victoria's Day. Lucky, for, lucky for Sandra, she wasn't there. I know. She would have Listen, had to mop up the mess. Talking about trauma, I think I mentioned this to you, but last week I was dropped driving along the motorway and my tire blew out oh god yes you yeah, did i did mm, fucking scary um, it was really scary and when i i got to i had to go to kent not unnecessary travel i work as a care of my father-in-law he lives there and a good friend of mine in kent nuna she told me where to go to get my tire yeah she <laughs> <up> your- <laughs> no, she, <laughs> she told me where to go to get my tire fixed right and get get a new spare and i had to get a couple because the aa the rac or aa man said to me you've got another dodgy tire this is going to happen to you on the way home you need to get the other tire changed as well i only just got them changed about six months ago anyway asked mm-hmm. my friend nina where to go is that there's a place next door to her house practically where i went and there was a lovely man there who said come back tomorrow so i brought the little old man in the car he stayed in the car while they jacked up the <laughs> he was like on a fun what? fair right <laughs> so my father-in-law stayed in the car they said oh he can stay and it's fine the, this chap he was only about 30 <laughs> so the same age as my son right my eldest son uh we had the most intriguing conversation he was very okay. chatty while he changed four of my tires he had quite a few properties in his portfolio he's been buying and selling houses since he was very you know about 10 years before because he got an inheritance when he was about 18 and he watched his sister okay. drink it and snort it up oh. her nose and stuff so he knew he was going to do better than that so and he'd been estranged from his family from 14 i think he lived a life like living in um like traveling with people's like markets and festivals and things since he was 14 oh okay carny folk well i said carny i didn't say that i said <laughs> i said like gypsies and he said no <laughs> i think i think carny folk is a little nicer <laughs> i don't yeah, know it's it, gypsy. it wasn't <laughs> carny or gypsy i don't know what it was mm. exactly but we talked about children because he's going to leave, you know, he's in a position to leave flats and properties to his three children. And I had a couple of, ch- I have three children as well. And we discussed that. And he said that he had one and w- which was a, a baby or no, one, which was, I can't remember how old they were, but three young kids, two belong to his fiance. They're getting okay. married. And the other one was an accident. And I got really confused. He had to explain it to me. He was with his fiance with her two children, who he raises as his own. Then they split up for six months. And while they were split up, he got another girl pregnant. Oh, then Jesus. he and his fiance got back together again. Yeah. And he had a baby with another woman. I said, okay. well, she, she's very open-minded to take you back. Aren't you lucky? I, I said, <laughs> I doubt that would fly with me. He said, oh, no, we're pretty open-minded. We go, we swing. We, oh, we're my God. Yeah. God. And then he gave you an invite. No, it's thank a- God. Because I, w- I blanched. I was like, oh, Michelle, you say that I know nothing about Pornhub. I can tell you so much now about swinging and a place called <laughs> Bristol Gardens in Brighton, which is a health spa or something. It's like a spa for couples and singles. It's a sw- swinging club. He goes there. He also is into oh. dogging. So all this is happening while my father-in-law is going up and down in my car, <laughs> <laughs> not knowing what the hell's going on. I was completely shocked. I went from complete admiration in the way this man could, you know, invest his, his life money. Around. Yeah, and then I was like, "Oh, he said he goes to orgies, and they often oh watch my God. every now and again. He'll have a cheeky beep boop like this." And I was like, "Oh," <gasps> I said, "That's very open minded." He says, "You know, well, you, you find someone who shares the same kind of values." Yes, <laughs> you got to keep him. You got to marry him. I was like, well, "Wow, fair, fair play to you." Uh, so thanks, Nina, for sending me. <laughs> <laughs> they get a nudist speech, she's dogging, all of it. Well, there's a show on the BBC called Dogging Tales. Ooh. I remember, yeah, I, I kind of accidentally sort of clicked on it and then was like, whoa, okay. And Andreas was like, why are you watching Dogging Tales? I'm like, <laughs> it's it's a psychology of human nature. It's yeah. It's really bizarre. There's this one woman, it's in the UK, and... She's obviously had loads of surgery. She's really insecure. And basically, her husband's the one that takes her out there and pimps her out to all of these. Oh, my stranger God. Tru- yeah, stranger truck drivers who just come up, line oh my up, God. have a go, piss off. And she loves it. That's horrific. 
She loves it. She said oh. it makes her feel really sexy and beautiful. And the wow. husband's like, yep, we love it. Holy. Like, Whoa. I'm not watching that. Do, do you know what? No, don't. Different strokes for different, different folks. folks. That's right. <laughs> <sighs> well, changing the subject, Mish. She made it awkward. She made, made it awkward. awkward. She How made did it I make awkward. it awkward? Awkward, awkward. awkward. She, awkward. awkward. she, she made you. it awkward. She awkward. made it awkward. Awkward, awkward. She made it awkward. Awkward, 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 well, you know, we've had a few requests for more stories on psychic detectives. So there we go. Psychic investigators. Yeah. Uh, clairvoyants who yep. work with police. The police. Yeah. Yes. Not Stuart to Copeland. To solve crimes. Not but Stuart yes. Cro- But Stuart Copeland, if you ever want to investigate us, we're here <laughs> for it. <laughs> Give us a call. Um No, but it's really fascinating. Really fascinating. I think we, you know, we'd said this in a previous um, episode that they don't take it seriously like police will never admit to taking psychics seriously but I believe that any good investigator will have a number of psychics in their sort of toolbox because even though the psychic may not solve the crime because mm. you will need forensics and evidence and all of this course stuff. you can't that can't stand up in court can it no but I they will give clues. Yeah. They will give clues. And these clues are sometimes absolute bullshit. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they solve cases. Well, I have a story about Britain's biggest manhunt, which was thankfully assisted by a psychic. Okay. Do you want to hear about Go for it? Yeah, I don't know who you're talking about. When, well, it, what era are we talking? In, tw- in the 2000s, in 2002. Okay. 2000. <laughs> I'll start, I'll start that again. <laughs> the era is, uh, what do you call the era of 2002? Just say 2002. Well, it's 2002. In the 2000s. You may remember this horrific murder. <laughs> it's something that I think about almost daily because what? I have a, te- a 10-year-old daughter. It's the Soham murders. Oh, God. The yeah, two 10-year-old okay. girls, Jessica and really Holly. Famous. Holly, Holly yeah. Wells and Jessica Chapman, mm. who are uh, 10-year-old girls. It was in Cambridgeshire, Soham, which is a little village up in Cambridgeshire in England. Mm-hmm. August, so it was summer. They were at a family barbecue. Those two girls hung out all together all the time, like my daughter and her best friend on our street. And one day they went for a wander and didn't return. And there was a massive manhunt. I think it I was. I remember this. Do you, do you need to refer to your nerds? <laughs> Let me just look at my nerds. One moment, please. What's that you say? I just need to look at my nerds. Your nerds. 13 days. It was 13 days they were searching for the Searching for, the for them. Yeah, they had no yeah, idea. Fuck. Nowhere, no idea where to start. But sadly, they were found. It was Ian Huntley, who was the caretaker at the girls' school, I believe. And his girlfriend had given him an alibi or had... Was also she was also done for perverting the course of justice. Perverting the course of justice. That's it. Maxine, her name is Maxine. I have got Is it Maxine Carr? Yes, that's it. Uh, people were astounded, just horrified. She now lives. I think she's in witness protection somewhere. Yeah. He was convicted of the murder of both girls on the seventeenth of December two thousand and three, and sentenced to two terms of life imprisonment, oh. minimum term forty years. Oh, Maxine Carr was actually the girls' teaching assistant. She was yes, in their classroom that's daily. Right. Yeah. She provided the police with a false alibi for him. But also, I do believe that they trusted her. She was in the car. No, she wasn't in the car. It wasn't in the car. Uh, if, from oh, what I remember, okay. they walked past his house, and he said, "Come oh, on fuck. in." And she oh. gave a she gave an alibi for him. Anyway, she did three and a half years in the end for her conspiring to pervert the course of justice. But she now yeah. lives in witness protection. So okay. the efforts that were made to locate Holly and Jessica in the thirteen days of their disappearance were described as the most intense and extensive in British criminal history. This mm. is where a family friend of the Wells family got in touch with a man they knew to be a psychic who was local in Cambridgeshire. His name was Dennis Mackenzie. So with the, the Wells family's say-so, he got involved. Mm-hmm. Okay. They brought him in. They brought him in. He says, I was really hoping my spirit guide would give me some good news, but as I got closer to Soham, I had a heavy feeling of foreboding. As I got out mm-hmm. of the car, I heard my guide saying in a very clipped, precise voice, they're dead. 
I think that was a voice inside all of our fucking heads, though, unfortunately, at the time. Yeah. He said he felt sick inside. And when he arrived at Kevin and Nicola Wells's home, he asked them how, how direct they wanted him to be with them. Yeah, OK. They just begged him to be straight. So he had to break the news of what he knew. Yeah. He says, back then, I had never, ever had to say anything so terrible to anyone. Words cannot describe my feelings. So he was absolutely gutted to be to be yeah. delivering this news. He explained that the girls were dead by 7.30 on the day of their disappearance. God, that's very specific information. Yep. Fuck. Yep. He described a woman with a shrew-like face and brown hair and a man in his 30s with low intelligence and walked with a swagger. He said they had northern accents. Now, both Huntley and Carr were from Humberside. Cambridgeshire is more middle of the country, to the north of London, but it's not quite north, so they wouldn't have northern accents there. Dennis also told the family that the girls had been transported, once they'd been murdered, in an old red car wrapped in something like carpet or bubble wrap. He described the view from the house where they'd been killed with a ditch outside the window and a tall building like a windmill with no sails in the distance. There's a grain silo outside Carr and Huntley's this cottage. This guy is amazing. Yeah. And they did have a, and there was a ditch running alongside it. Yeah. So Kevin Wells relayed the information to the police and the girls' okay. bodies were found in shallow water just as Dennis had oh. predicted. Oh, God. So Dennis stayed friends with the Wells family and Kevin Wells thanked him for his remarkable contributions during his darkest days in a book that he wrote called Goodbye, Dearest Holly. He says... Dennis does possess an extraordinary gift and he publicly announced Dennis to be the genuine article. I'd fucking say so. Yeah. Jesus Christ. A bit more about Dennis. He still charges a modest £40 for readings and does all his criminal investigation works for free. He says he'd never charge a man to tell him that his daughter is dead. Oh, fucking hell. And he says he's aware that he has a gift, but it's not a gift for me, he says. He says it's to help what do you others. Mean? It's not a gift for him. It's for okay. other people. So he's not there to make money. He's no. there to help. No. Yep. It's okay. interesting what he goes on to say. He said he was once offered 10 grand to do a reading for a wealthy woman in Kuala Lumpur, but he refused the check. He said he always charges the same, whether it's a celebrity, a film star or an everyday person. I'll give him 40 quid. <laughs> I'd love to know what he has to say for me. <laughs> he said he feels very strongly that if he did exploit this gift for profit, then he'd lose it which is what we've heard about other people like yeah. you know, who have gifts. Dennis says that as a young child, he could see in, and hear things that were unseen by others and that his first memory of a psychic experience was when he was recovering from a burn in hospital when he was four years old. He said there was a special nurse that used to come in and sit by his bed at night, giving him the feeling of total calm. And it wasn't until years later that he realised there was no nurse. It was oh. somebody from the spirit world. And his parents just thought that he had imaginary friends, but he said that he was surrounded by spirits, some benign, some nasty, all of his life. Fucking hell. Can you imagine that? He can't sleep at night. He says he can barely sleep at night most nights because he sees ghosts every day and, and there's noisy spirits clamoring to be heard nightly. Poltergeists! He's wondered if he's mentally ill. Could it be that the various things that he sees and feels and hears are mm. signs of mental illness? He's actually thought that of himself. Well, I told you about the psychic I went to in Sydney who told me all some crap I don't know anyway it turns out she was sectioned a year later oh that's right yes, yes. yeah wow. and, and all of these like you know wealthy eastern suburbs ladies were all going to her yeah, and basing exactly. like important life decisions on uh-huh. this on this woman who actually turned out to be crazy so that was look, a good story I can, but I can see how you can think do I have a gift or am I just fucking losing my mind i'm glad that dennis was exploring that within his own mind because you know he is he's been taken seriously and he says Mm. publicly if i'm bonkers how how come so much of the time i'm right yeah he says he has had inquiries to investigate the disappearance of madeline mccann Mm. and would be keen to help but he'd need to be asked directly by the family he's not just going to insert himself in in somewhere he's not going to He's not going to just offer up his information because, like, for example, during the Holly and Jessica murder, in, or the missing, when they were missing, the police had 3,000 psychics get in touch. They wrote oh. in and rang in to offer their theories, most of them accusing Holly's dad of the killing. No. Oh, my God. Uh-huh. So they really, it was Needle in a Haystack that they chose the right psychic. Yeah, I guess so. I'm I, I'm guessing that the friend of the family that chose him mm. probably did so because one, he's local, and two, 
perhaps he he'd had some success with previous cases because he's actually been involved with quite a few cases which I, I don't go into de- detail today but yeah. Um, but he does say this about the majority of so-called psychics. He says they're mostly frauds. It's no wonder that people are mistrustful of them. He's seen, yeah. he, like he's been to psychic shows where he's seen them ask straight up, you know, hands up who's who's lost someone to cancer and half the room will put their hand up. Yeah. And then failing that, they'll go for a young man, like who's lost a young man in a in a motorcycle accident or a car accident. Another, you know, he'll, they'll just take yeah. it from there and off they go. Yeah. So Dennis says... He says sometimes in a reading, he doesn't get anything, but he has to be honest and say so. So he says it's not about doing flashy tricks on TV or pulling the wool over people's eyes. He's just an ordinary bloke and he hopes that he's doing some good with the gifts that he's been given. It's all it's all about putting himself at the service of others. And he truly believes that helping people is in itself its own reward. What a nice man. What a nice chap. Well, do you know what? Funny you should talk about Madeleine McCann because when I was coming across a few psychics, there was this one that came up. She calls herself the Persian medium. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, The Persian psychic, Persian medium. Um, She also calls herself subconscious mind surgeon, a.k.a. (laughs) celebrity medium, a.k.a. film producer, a.k.a. master entrepreneur, a.k.a. Clinical hypnotherapist. These are all the taglines she gives she, herself. She right? wears many hats by the sound of it. Yeah, and she's had a lot of surgery too. Like I went on her Instagram and and look, I'm I don't I'm not getting judgy about what people want to do to their bodies, but she's Oh, you mean like plastic surgery? Yeah, man, she's had it all. She's like one of those kind of like the big lips, the big boobs, the big bum, you know, she's had I, I, anyway, she's got 3.3 million followers, so she's oh. doing something right. But I was very confused, Jordy. Very confused. You're confused? Why well, she's she a glamour model or a psychic, you know. Ah. She's just, yeah, it's hard to tell from her Insta. But anyway, and on her Insta, she's like in and out of fancy cars and whatever. So she had a little weigh-in on the Madeleine McCann case. And yeah. in January this year, she posted, Madeleine is still alive. And, yeah, and she says direct from her Instagram, and this is a quote, when you are connected to a sense of truth, the fight for right never ends. With the unfortunate story of Madeleine McCann, I'm not going to give up. Just just couple years ago, that's her words, bad spelling, just couple, just couple years ago, right? my calls for truth in her story were missed. Finally, it came to light that my predictions were accurate. Like I said, I will never stop fighting for justice and the truth. Is she still talking about Madeleine McCann at this point? Yeah. Search Fio Johansson and Madeleine McCann. You will, fa- you will found, her words again, so many articles and the truth about her case. She is alive. Red heart emoji. So mm. I did. I googled yeah. Fia Johansson and Madeleine McCann. And do you know Who? what comes up? Madeleine McCann! <laughs> Fia Who's- Johansson... Madeline McCann. I don't understand. What are you talking about? Are you saying Via? Fia, F I A. Fia? Who is that? The Persian medium. Oh. Are you losing your mind? <laughs> <laughs> I had the rum today. <laughs> I was confused and I'll tell you why. Because okay. you called her everything. Like you called her a surgeon, you called her um, the Persian psychic, <laughs> you called her everything, but you never named her. What's she on about? What? Huh? Silly bitch. What? Oh, I thought I said her name was Fia. Fia Johansson. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So when you said search Fia Johansson and Madeleine McCann, I thought you were talking about that she was talking about the German paedophile who has been linked with her disappearance. No. Well, she does go on to link that. So yeah. basically after she had this invitation to search for her and Madeleine McCann on, on Google, Googler, was she invited? She, was she invited? Invitited? No, she was not invited by the family. No. no. She's just and then she should fuck off. out there. Well, you would think so, according to Dennis. You have to be invited or you fuck yep. right out of it, right? Dennis, I've got respect for. Yeah, me too. Fia, I'm not so sure because when, right. I, when I searched for her and Madeleine McCann, uh, there is not any evidence really that she predicted fuck all before the German yeah. suspect was found. And yeah. then, obviously, the German was cleared of wrongdoing. Was he? Yeah, he was. And then a lot of her PR comes from her own website. So when you Google her name and Madeleine McCann, it all just goes to her 
her oh, website. I see. And I think what she's also done is she's just trying to drive traffic. Drive traffic and she's re edited re edited dates of posts. Oh my So it looks like she's goodness. Yeah. That's naughty. No, Dennis would um, look, not approve I don't know of that. for sure. This is just my hunch because okay. it, it doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. So yeah. And then I went on to the hard hitting bastion of journalism, Daily Star Online. Oh, um, <laughs> Is that where I got all my fantastic news I know, about the ghost, it's a gold the ghost lover? <laughs> and to, so, and I searched for you know Fia and and Maddie, and there was an article on her. You know, psychic Fia Johansson, also known as Persian medium, says Madeleine McCann is alive and well, and is channeling her biological parents' concern for her, which. Obviously, you know, she's saying Madeline is alive and she yeah. goes on with all this rubbish about Jerry and, and Kate um, McCann and how Madeline doesn't know where she is or who she is, but she can channel the love and all this bullshit. But basically, oh it's such a non-story and also it is just to drive traffic to her Insta. She is, if we had to do fake or real, meh, meh, she's a fakie. Beep She's bop. a fake psychic. Yeah, and I think they're the ones that give people a yeah. bad name. But also uh, psychics, psychic detectives a bad name because there are people who are doing fantastic work. Fantastic mm. work. Yeah. Yeah, so I had this fantastic American case and I think there needs to be a trigger warning here because okay. Little Grim. Trigger warning. Warning. Trigger warning. This is a case of Betty Cornish. So back... In August 8th, 1987, in Belvedere, New Jersey, in America, 42-year-old Betty Cornish, who was a divorced mother and also a nurse, was found viciously attacked in her bed. And she was found face up with her hands bound with an extension cord. But actually, the, the murder was way more brutal because it turns out she died from a hammer attack. And oh. another trigger warning. Sounds like the stalker. What's he called? What, Night Stalker? Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, this is even more grim. They use the claw end of the hammer. Stop it. Which oh. is really fucking gruesome. Anyway, so I think it was Betty's boyfriend who raised the alarm um, to the police about Betty because... Okay, he'll be suspect number one. Yeah, exactly. And, you yeah. know, he, he'd walked in, found found Betty, um, called the cops, and, yeah, like they do always, he became suspect number one. But the mm-hmm. thing is, he had a watertight alibi. He said he was out fishing. And he could prove every step of the way that he was out fishing. And also he found her like fucking terrible. And did the Um, family not believe that either? They probably backed him, did they? Well, he was a relatively recent boyfriend. So I think they didn't know that much about it. But I and look, I don't think you recover from seeing that. If you didn't do it, I think that's so fucking grim. But anyway, the police came round uh, when he alerted them. And they did their due diligence and, like, door knocked all the neighbours. But no one in her apartment complex said they'd heard anything suspicious. So they just kind of left it at that. Mm -hmm. Although, curiously, they did discover there was blood in the bathtub and also on the bathroom mirror, which indicated that maybe the killer had cleaned up after themselves, right, Mm -hmm. in her bathroom. But more than that, they found a fingerprint on the window in the bathroom on the inside of the glass, not the outside. And this made them think that Betty's killer knew her and hadn't broken in. Yeah. So like you said, yeah, they went straight for the boyfriend first. But, yeah. you know, he'd been out fishing. And, and actually they did find fishing clippers outside her window, but he was like – you know, look, I just put them there. Like I store mm. my fishing stuff outside. I live so, here or whatever. Yeah, yeah, you know. So he was eventually cleared as a suspect. And then the police kind of hit a wall. So they went back to all the neighbours and fingerprinted them and made them take polygraph tests. And they all passed. All the neighbours passed this polygraph test. Wow. And so it was just another dead end. And then Betty's sister Peggy contacted a psychic called Nancy Weber. And this was eight days after Betty's death. So Peggy goes to psychic Nancy and Nancy says to her, the chief suspect is the boyfriend, but he's not the killer. And then she said, I see a hammer and a woman tied up in her bed who has been brutally murdered and I see the killer. And go to the police and tell them I want to talk to them. Because 
she was not going to go to the police on her own. She wanted the yeah. family to the go family to the police. To, yeah, yeah exactly. So, again, a little bit like with your story, mm. unless the family's involved, this psychic is not going to... You can't just have a dream and then no. pick up the phone and say, oh, I think there's been a murder. No. <laughs> so <laughs> then so then the detective on the case, and I don't have his name in my notes, sorry, he he worked with Nancy before in other cases. So he was like, fuck, this woman might actually have some proper intel here. So he got in touch with Nancy and then he took her to the murder scene. And then when they were outside Betty's apartment, Nancy said she got this really strong vision and she looks up the flat above Nancy's and she mm. sees a shadow and she says, that's mm. him. That's the killer. Amma. He's Amma. up there. Yeah. And then, get this, she says to the investigator, his first name is John and his last name begins with the letter R. And you know what? They would have had that on record because they've already interviewed everybody and, and polygraphed them. She didn't know this. Fucking no, but the police. Dude upstairs the police is will. called John yeah. and his surname is Reese. Yep. So she like, bam, got it. Bam. Bam. Boom. And uh, Bing, bang, so, bong. But then even though she, she gave them that, the investigator yeah. was like, mm, I'm not sure it's he's not the enough. guy because yeah. he passed the polygraph test and he has an alibi. So, yeah. mm. And then they, the police had done some estimates on when she was murdered. And, and she's like, he's like, well, it doesn't fit the time frame because she's yeah. like, I swear to God, I'm getting a vision uh, that she was murdered at 1.30. And they're like, no, it was midnight. And she's like, I don't care what you say. Your timeline is wrong. Mm-hmm. Reinvestigate. And she was mm. really, really clear about it. And she was like, I don't care if he's got an alibi. That dude is a killer. But he, but the police kept saying he's not a person of interest. So then they take Nancy inside. And honestly, I fucking hope they cleaned up because can you imagine going into a murder mm. scene? And also, can you actually imagine being a well, cleaner the, the person that i was going to say the person who has to clean it has to go into a murder scene kim and aggie the shit out of a place like that i who who even. used to be oh it was anton levey wasn't he the witchcraft what he witchcraft. was a murder cleaner he was uh, he was a photographer he was a murder photographer that's it he was okay. a crime scene photographer yeah yeah but you have i mean we've seen you in your marigolds imagine having to get those on and <laughs> clean up murder he'd want a he'd want a hazmat suit Jesus Christ, it would just be terrible. But anyway, so look, psychic Nancy went into the bedroom and she stood beside Betty's bed. And like I said, she had this vision of the time yeah. of, of death. And then her final vision, she said it was a bit blurry, but she saw in her vision a metallic buckle, like a Western belt buckle. And she said, this buckle is on a belt and it belongs to the killer and it's really important to him so please she was begging them please take another look at the neighbor john reese and the Mm. detective was like yeah all right look i'll take an i'll take a gamble on you and they sent detectives around to talk to john reese and they were like "Mm, something's a bit off here but they kept going back because they wanted to try and build a bond with this guy and eventually he started to open up and gave them some weird info which was a little bit like making out that he had been in betty's apartment and Mm. then 11 days after the murder, the fingerprint on the window turns out fucking John Reese's fingerprint. Yep. No, but you know what? Dude just shrugs it off and he's like, <gasps> yeah, yeah, whatever. I helped her unjam that window a few times. What, with blood on his finger? Yeah. So he, he, they're not buying it. And then, the, like, like you had said, the medical examiner revised the time of Betty's death, putting it later than midnight where it turns out Reese. John Reese had no alibi. So he is definitely at this point shaping up to be the number yeah. one suspect in the case. Okay. But they need the murder weapon. Yes. So they go back to psychic Nancy to see if she can help. And you know what? She fucking comes through with the goods. So she said she had a vision of a swamp and she was like, that's where you're going to find the hammer. And oh, then amazing. gets get, fucking get this, gets out a pen and paper, draws a goddamn map. Mm-hmm. leading them straight to where they're going to find the murder weapon. And she's like, this is where the hammer is. So they go back to John and they're like, dude, come on. We know you did it. Just tell us all about it. And he ev- eventually confesses to it. And uh-huh. he tells them where the hammer is on the map. Same place. Nancy had told them. So she's a fucking hero. She's the real deal. 
Yeah. Is she is she the one? Now, because I did do a little bit of research and I think I've seen her name come up. Is mm-hmm. she the one that also had some information for Jean Benet Ramsey's murder? Don't know, you know about that. Don't know. Okay. No, yeah. I don't. I don't know any more about Nancy. I'd like to look her up because I bet she's got some good cases under her belt. She like, has. She she's is one of the, the real deal. dealio. Yeah. But, yeah. but then there are people. You know? Do you know? Do you ever watch that TV show Medium? With no. Patricia Arquette, and she's this medium called Alison Dubois, and she's married to a nice guy called Joe, and they've got three lovely blonde ch- children. I think they're all girls, okay, and they've no. all inherited their mother's supernatural ability. And she works for the DA's office wherever no, I've they never are. Never seen it. Is it worth watching? I actually used to really enjoy it. Okay. I used to like, I don't know how many seasons there are. I don't know if it's still going, but I used to really like that show. And I yeah. love Patricia Arquette. Isn't she wonderful? Yeah, she's great. But you love all the real, Patricias. I love all the Pats. <laughs> uh, there's a real life Alison Dubois. It was based on a real person. Okay. Yeah. So it was Phoenix. Phoenix, Arizona is where it was based. And okay. the, the real Alison Dubois claims that she has worked with law enforcement agencies across the country in lots of different criminal investigations and she wrote a book called don't kiss them goodbye and that got her enough attention that kelsey grammar aka frasier who i love and his production company yeah they produced the program oh wow so as a result of this i was watching this the reason why i know about this is because i have just because i'm so bereft at the end of line of duty i noticed <laughs> that <laughs> um there's a there's what do you call it the real housewives of beverly hills is on and i started watching that and it is absolute car crash tv michelle don't you start. really must be at the lowest of the low it's a low point for me but in it is kelsey Grammer and his wife or now ex-wife Camille, she's one of the the Real Housewives. Okay, and she she kind of came off as a bit of a bitch in this first season that I've been watching, mm-hmm. and until the end of the series when her husband actually dumps her. What? Frasier? It's horrific. Fraser yeah, dumped, dumped her. <gasps> yeah, he dumped no. her and had another woman in the wings. Yes, not very no. nice. So then you end up feeling a bit sorry for her. Yeah. Mm. But there was a scene in it because so because Kelsey Grammer's production company has done the Medium show, which is mm. quite big, med- Medium with Patricia Arquette. Medium. They are they are friends with the real life Alison Dubois, who okay. is a consultant on the program. Okay. So yeah, so there was a bit of an argy bargy between Camille, who was a little bit stuck up. Her, she had a bit of a pole up her bum during the whole of this first season of of Real Live Housewives, whatever it's called. And she had a dinner party. The girls aren't getting on with her very well. There's been a few rough and tumbles, like a few arguments. And she has a dinner party at her house. Yeah. Do you want to say something? Well, are they actually friends in real life or are all these people thrown together because of the TV show? They're thrown together for the TV show, but Alison Dubois is actually friends with Camille in real life because she's a consultant on the show that her husband's production company work on. So this okay. is years ago. It's old. This is old. It's about 10 or 15 years old, this old program. Old nurse. <laughs> so they're at this dinner party. Yeah. And I guess Camille kind of needs backup. So she's got her best friend there. And mm-hmm. she's got Alison Dubois there because she knows she's fun at dinner parties. Because one, she's psychic. Two, she likes a cocktail. And okay. she, three, she likes to smoke a, she was smoking uh, like an electric cigarette throughout the whole thing. And she was flying on these cocktails, right, when all the housewives came and sat down. Can I just tell you, I'm just having visions of Hazel, the psychic real estate agent. Great fun <laughs> of parties, loves a cocktail, has a durry. That's all I'm saying. Should I just slip out the back for a durry? All right, <laughs> Hazel, if you're listening. <laughs> Big up to Shut Hazel. Out. Shout out. Shout out. Shout out. Shout out. out. You're, shout getting out. A shout out. you're getting a shout out. <laughs> you're getting a shout out. Um, okay, so anyway, this one. Alison, she turned out to be a, a, an absolute bitch. Apparently, you know, she's got a bit no filter when she's had a few ooh, cocktails. Ooh. And uh, when she was asked by one woman if her grandmother was here, and now this woman's grandmother, Lisa Vanderpump, her name was, her, her grandmother meant a lot to her. Yeah. So she asked, you know, is my grandmother here? Because this... That the lady sitting, she's kind of like Miss sitting on a big throne at the top of the table, smoking her fags and drinking her giant bowl of fish bowl full of cocktails. Going, oh yeah, because you know I carry a gun and I'm I've been solving what? serial killer murders for years. Blah blah blah. And she she just asks, is my grandmother here? And she says, I'm off the clock, honey. We're no! here to have fun. <gasps> yeah. No. 
what a bitch. But you know what? Late in later episodes, they have a seance with a more trusted psychic, and she says, "You know what? Your grandmother was there that night, and she was desperately trying to get through, but oh. Alison just wasn't able to pass on the message." Oh. More cocktails are being drunk, mm-hmm. and later on, she lays into one of the housewives who was admittedly she was pressing her to to show off her talents, you know, to come off the to get on the clock. <laughs> yeah, she's like, oh, come on, give us something, give us something. Yeah. And it was a bit annoying that she was pushing her like that. But you know what, Alison Dubois, she was sitting there bragging about her talents anyway. Yeah. So eventually she turns to her and says, all right, know this, your husband will never emotionally fulfill you. Oh. My and every God. time she delivered some sort of bitchy comment, know this. Oh, know that. Know this. Know that, yeah. <gasps> Fuck. Then there's this huge argument. That's it's awful. disgusting. There's this huge argument and they all leave and she's sitting there like, ha, ha. And she says, I love that I know when each of them are going to die and what happens to their families. I love that about me. And then she says something like, if anything ever happens to their kids and they want me to help find them, fuck them. Oh, my God. And I bet you she doesn't charge 40 quid for a reading. I bet you she's fucking policing Uh, everybody. Yeah, probably. So she's got this book uh, called Don't Kiss Them Goodbye. She's got loads of books, Michelle, as you can probably imagine, tons yeah. of them. And I bet the, you she's had all of them ghostwritten. I bet you she hasn't written a single fucking book. Uh, okay, well, I, I don't know the answer to that. But what I do know is it's all got the same uh, – the same person appears in all of them, which is her now dead friend, Dominie Sitz. She was her best friend. Okay. They moved in together after college, after their that they moved out of home together. They were great mates. And Dubois – claimed to have predicted Dominie's death when she was 19 she told that she Dominique. told her Dominy. she said you you know I predict that you're going to die and she encouraged Sitz to quit smoking okay. because she foresaw her death so that she, she remembers them watching Beaches together that film with um, yeah yeah Bette wind Midler. beneath my wings yeah wind beneath my <laughs> wings I'm sure it doesn't go like that and she remembers promising to Sitz that she would care for her children if she ever died young and all this kind of stuff oh, but Dominic's younger Dominique's younger sister Karen Sitz remembers their friendship rather differently she said she's pretended this relationship with my sister but they're anything but best friends she huh. says they. They were friends, but the kind that got into fights all the time. She and my sister had a falling out. Frenemies. Mm. They had a falling out and didn't talk until she was dying and got back in touch. What a bitch. Alison Dubois talks about Dominique Sitz in all of her interviews. She sits on Oprah's couch and all sorts of things. And in a 2005 radio interview, she said, the thing that was nice was I was able to take her fear away, she says. And when she was getting ready to pass, she was like, you're right, I can see my grandfather and I know that I know that he's here and all the spirits are here. And it was very important to me that, that she knew that before she died. That's what Alison said about Domini, right? Okay. Karen, the sister, comes in and says, that's all a lie. Her sister died of a malignant melanoma yeah. and her death, as she describes it, was very gruesome. Oh. She said, Domini saw no one but family in the months before she died. And two weeks before her death, she entered a drug-induced coma that she never came out of. Oh so there were no God. angels. There were no trumpets. There was no, oh, I can see the light before I'm yeah. going to cross the bridge. None of that happened. She also says, and this is a trigger warning. Oh, so God. brace yourself. All right. I want to clarify. The last time Alison saw Domini, she was still walking around. She was cognizant and she was nowhere near dying. Domini was terrified of dying. Okay. Because she thought she because she thought she was going to go to hell, so she held on to life to the point where her body actually began to decompose. What? I want to stress what a terrible state my sister was in when she died. Because if Alison had known, I'm sure she would have written something about that in one of her books. She says. It was the worst thing I've ever been through in my life. When Alison writes about my sister's death, it's really romanticised. And the fact of the matter is, it was ugly and it was painful. That is fucking terrifying. And and that is actually, you know, this woman, Alison Dubois, what a fucking fake. She's up there with fear. Well, she says that that's completely wrong. And she said the only reason why she wasn't around during Dominique's hospice care was because the family wouldn't let her in. And she says the family couldn't know the depth of their friendship and their relationship because they weren't always there to witness it. She says, it's frustrating. I memorialised her, as in her books, and half the world is in love with her and praying for Dominique's daughter, Marissa. That's all positive. I don't see how it could make them angry. 
Well, um, she's just made a fuckload of cash off the the death off of somebody else's misery. Yeah, and yeah, uh, that's just not nice. And you have to tread carefully with those things. You do. She oh. has an ex husband. Dominic has an ex husband called Dominic Scala, who did take care of Dominic through much of her illness, mm. and he actually corroborates Dubois' story. And oh. he said that she has gone out of her way to care for Marissa, the daughter, uh, in the years since the death of her mother. So that's good. Yeah, maybe she's like giving some backhanded dollar to the. Yeah. to the, the daughter because she feels guilty because she knows she's exploited this Well, she's making all this dollar. Yeah. yeah, exactly. From all of her, basically, the, she's the one who's got her started on her journey, on her money-making oh, God. journey. She, so anyway, this lady, Alison Dubois, she claims she has dreams and visions of both the past and the future, plus she has head tapping where she can read people's thoughts, okay. which I think she couldn't do at the table that night because she'd had too many cocktails. <laughs> right. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Uh, she says it helps if the if the murderer has had contact with the victim. Yeah. Now, in her home county of Phoenix, Arizona, I yeah. think it is, there was um the poli- there's a couple of enforcements, police enforcement. There's Texas Rangers and the Glendale, Arizona Police Department, and they have each said that the tips provided by Dubois were not helpful. Oh. Or they or they have denied any cooperation from Dubois ever existed. Okay. But then again, going back to what you said at the top of the show today, quite often the police won't, they won't admit to having help, will they? Really? No, and actually um, there was something I read from the United States Office of Justice Department where, and, and fair enough, this is back in 1979, Office of Justice Department in Los Angeles conducted a study to evaluate whether psychics could be considered a useful tool during investigation of major crimes and solving cold cases. And this study, they basically did like a, an experiment where they used 12 psychics who had good reputations and then gave them four crimes, two solved and two unsolved, which the psychics had no prior knowledge of. And look, this was before the internet, so it's mm. not like you could easily research, you know, unpublicized cases. So then the psychics were given numbered envelopes with evidence inside and asked to give details about the case and any information about the cases. And, well, actually, sadly, the conclusion of the study was that while the psychics could give some information about the case, like the sex of the victim and the general idea of the crime that was committed, the conclusion was that the data from the study showed that psychics couldn't really provide any significant info leading to the solution of any major crimes. So what I find most interesting about that is that the United States Justice Department even thought it was valid to conduct a study. I mean, they poo-pooed it, but yeah. they obviously thought there was something in it. But I think they, people like Dennis and Nancy show that mm. there are, when you get the real deal, they can be really useful. But if you think about it, they can't They can't kind of welcome. No. You, they can't say that because they'll, they'll be inundated. I know, they open saying, the floodgates to yeah. crackpots. For sure. So-and-so did it. The dad did it. The husband did it. You know, whatever. Oh, it's always the bloody husband. Well, quite often it is, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of the husband, you, I did want to just touch on the case of Lynn Dawson. And oh. look, you listen to the podcast. Teacher's pet. Yeah. Yeah. And so for anyone who doesn't um, know this case or who didn't listen to Teacher's Pet, which you really should because it's one of the most brilliant podcast series ever made. Um it started off as an investigation into the disappearance of Lynn Dawson, um, but it actually ended up being – this was teacher's pet, by the way. Yeah. It ended yeah. up being an expose of, like, a child exploitation ring on Sydney's northern beaches. PE teachers. Yeah, the PE teachers, teachers. in high schools oh, were disgusting. sexually abusing pupils. Absolutely Spoiler. fucking – Well – Look, it's been it's it's been all over the media for a long time, so it's it's fucking terrifying, and that just you know is a tip of the tip of the iceberg. So yeah. I don't know if you remember, but in in the Lynn Dawson case, they used a clairvoyant. And yes. look, I'll just give you a quick recap here. So, mother of two, Lynn Dawson, she disappeared from her home in Bayview on Sydney's northern beaches in January 1982, and her husband Chris Dawson, he was a kind of minor rugby league celebrity with Newtown Jets. Yes. Now yeah. this is where I think it's dodgy because you know mm. from my family history that I I told you yes. about. Yes. And yes. also if you ever watch those, um, what are they called, those programs about the underworld, there's some underworld yeah. characters in Newtown and they're all affiliated with the football. Absolutely. They are. They and when are. we say football, so, we're not talking about soccer. 
It's the other one, isn't it? Luke. Rugby. Rugby league. Rugby league. That's it. Yeah. And so he's already involved with the dodgy football club. And it turns out he was having an affair with Joanne Curtis, who... The babysitter. Well, who, he was his student. It's, that's right. She was his student. But then she, he tried to move her in as his baby, as the babysitter. Well, yeah, but obviously it's because he was fucking Under up. Lynn's nose, yeah. Yeah. And he wasn't, he didn't care how it looked either, did he? No. To, to and, Lynn. No, and look, they everywhere it says that they started the affair at 16, when she was 16. I don't actually no. believe that. There's a lot of murmurings that it was a murky beginning when she was 15 or younger. So really fucking wow. dodgeball. Anyway. Yeah, like I said, Chris Dawson was high school teacher at Croma High and uh, Joanne Curtis was his student. And look, at this stage, two coroners have basically come to the conclusion that Chris Dawson killed his wife, but he hasn't been convicted. He hasn't no, been he charged. was arrested. Last was time arrested. I was in Australia, mm. th- do you remember? I think yeah. you were there – or you were on a cruise with your mum, but <laughs> – the day after I arrived, yeah, he was being ushered out of his home. He was being arrested again. Yeah. But and nothing came of that either. Well, th- like I said, two coronial inquests, both ca- both saying he did it and they can't yeah. charge him, they can't pin it on him. So this is where psychic Debbie Malone comes into the frame. And she says she believes she knows where Lynn's body is buried. So psychic Debbie said back in 2018 that she'd been contacted by Lynn Dawson, who told her she'd been murdered and was buried under lime and carpet on the Bayview Bushland property where they had lived, right? Where um, she and Chris Dawson and the girls were living. Because it backed she, onto Bushland. Yes, yeah. at that stage. Yeah. It, well, I mean, now it's like super like mega million, you know, millionaires kind of area. But at that point, it was in the middle of nowhere on this big, big stretch of Bushland. And she said she had this vision that, her body was near a retaining wall so it turns out actually that psychic debbie had been helping the family with the case since 2003 because Mm -hmm. the abc aired an episode of australian story which is that amazing um show on the abc and the producers of the show put her in um two of lim dawson's siblings in touch with psychic debbie so and because apparently Psychic Debbie saw it, but she said she re- felt this immediate connection with Lynn and that she might be able to help. So uh, Lynn's yeah. sister Pat and her brother Greg. So many Pats in this episode. My God. A lot of Pats in the A world. I'm married to one. Yep. Um, yes, you are. My God. Tell me about that. Mm-hmm. Pats everywhere. So, yeah, they got in touch with Psychic Debbie and – they gave her a watch and a bracelet that had belonged to Lynn and also a few photos. And she used those I- items to kind of channel Lynn. And apparently, like, that's called psych- psychometry, where you take objects and then you get, like, visions and feelings and whatnot. And that's how she connected with Lynn. And she told them that Lynn was dead. And this is, remember, 2003 this is. Oh, because there was this facade of, of taking money out of the bank. Yep, because Chris Dawson had said that she would she knew that the mag- marriage was gone. going bad, so she cleared out the bank accounts and, and left and she's gone and she's overseas. But, yeah. I mean, yeah, but everyone who knows her said that she would never leave her kids. No way. I mean, yeah. you just, you don't do that. But anyway, so she had said, listen, Lynn's dead and she's met with foul play and... More than that, she'd never left her family home and she was close to the house. Remember, this is 2003. Uh-huh. So the siblings took her to the house and she, when she got there, she said to the police, look, you need to look at the back of the house where the retaining wall is. And she said that she felt like he'd put lime on her body, maybe a plastic bag over her head and that in her vision, <gasps> she saw him uh, throw water on her and then put a beige-coloured shag pile carpet on the top of her body and then cover it up with soil. And now the thing is... the Far out. I know. But I don't know if you remember this bit. In 2018, the police actually did do forensic excavations on part of the grounds Mm. outside the house. Yeah. But they only dug near the swimming pool, not the back of the house. So I don't know if they missed a trick because they didn't find anything in the places they dug. They didn't search where the psychic said. Do you remember there was also that concreter who had done work on the house back when the Dawsons first bought it and he said he'd poured concrete into areas of soft soil at the back of the house and also near the swimming pool at the front. 
And the thing is, the importance of the soft soil is that he said everywhere else around that whole bushland place was like absolutely rock hard. But this, he said, was soft like cheesecake. He said it was ridiculous and re- and that's it that's why it really that's stuck. Why it needed the retaining yeah wall. and it really stuck in his mind so like i said they excavated near the pool but not around the back where psychic debbie said that's where she is so why the fuck why didn't they, doing they do that? that i know it's expensive and i know they have dug up the pool and other things and and come up with nothing yeah. But it would make sense to go somewhere where it might be soft. I mean, maybe like you said, it's all been built upon now. I yeah, don't know. and look, I'm sure you know there's been. I would just love for that to have, you know, an ending. I know. I mean, that man, if he's innocent, he can't carry on until he's proven otherwise, and he's not been proven no, otherwise. He hasn't. I'm afraid we need a body. And look, yes, okay. So he was he was fucking a, an underage girl, which you know he was part of that PE sex ring. Dude was involved mm. with the Jets and this dodgy football club. I mean, you know, he hasn't got a lot of ticks, right? Mm. And his wife has disappeared without a trace. Two coroners have said he did it. But he's never been charged. And in our society, you're innocent until proven guilty. And he hasn't been proved mm-hmm. guilty. But why aren't they following this lead from that psychic? So watch this space, I guess. Amazing, Michelle. Oh, God, that's incredible. I love to. I'd love to hear kind of follow-ups from Teacher's Pet, which is truly the most wonderful podcast. Is it still on? Can people still hear Uh, it? I think it could be geo-blocked for some people, for some listeners. I had friends who were outside of Australia trying to listen and they said they they couldn't access it. But I'm sure if you use a VPN, you might be able to get it. So I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) Geo-blocking and VPNs and all sorts of magical new words. (laughs) Porn hubs! See, I'm a little bit more au fait with the porn hubs now. Do you know, uh, when I was, just before I came on, I was looking up what Bristol Gardens was. Oh, my God, I've read a review. Yeah, yeah, book no, it in. I'm not. Yeah, book it in. It just sounds like a bunch of really unattractive people doing all sorts of revolting things together on a massive six-foot bed. Oh, God. Do you know what? Each to their oh. own, Geordie. Each to their own. That's yeah. right. Horses for courses. <laughs> so there you go, psychic detectives. And... I would say anyone out there who maybe has a story that we haven't covered, if anyone has any leads, Love we want to know hear. because I, I'm sure this will not be the last time that we do psychic detectives. I, I would I would think that there's probably a lot more psychic detective work being done behind the yeah. scenes that we're aware of. Look, I think the good ones don't publicize themselves. They're not they don't have an Instagram account with three yeah. point six million followers yeah. or whatever you know like they're out there doing yeah. good work to help good people so maybe yeah, we, exactly. we'll, we won't hear about them totally well michelle darling that'll be it for us this week <laughs> and we, what we want you people to do is drop us a line at hello dot hello at eavesdroppingpodcast.com <laughs> thank you and check out the website, the Instagram, the Facebook. Interact with All us. All the socials. And but look, whatever you do, I just don't care what you do. I mean, horses for courses, all of that. But whatever you do, just don't stop. It's dropping. 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 It's dropping.